Good afternoon, my friends. I'm going to be reading Plato's Apology um, from the trial against Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher. This is Socrates' defense. How you have felt, O men of Athens, at hearing the speeches of my accusers, I cannot tell, but I know that their persuasive words almost made me forget who I was. Such was the effect of them, and yet they have hardly spoken a word of truth. Many as a... Many, but many as their falsehoods were, there was one of which uh, quite amazed me. I mean, when they told you to be upon your guard, not to let yourselves be deceived by the force of my eloquence. That they ought to have been ashamed of saying this, because they were, were sure to be detected as soon as I opened my lips and displayed my deficiency. They were certainly, they certainly did appear to be most shameless in saying this. By the force of eloquence, they seem, they mean the force of truth. The force of truth. For then I do indeed admit that I am eloquent, but in how different a way from theirs. Well. As I was saying, they have hardly uttered a word, or not more than a word, of truth. But you shall hear from me the whole truth, not, however, delivered af after their manner, and a set oration du duly ornamented with words and phrases. No, indeed, but I shall use the words and arguments which occur to me at the moment, for I am certain that this is right, and that at my time of life I ought not to be appearing before you, O men of Athens, in the character of a juvenile orator. Let no one expect this of me. I must beg of you to grant me one favor, which is this. If you hear me using the same words in my defense, which I have been in the habit of using, and which most of you have heard in the Agora, and at the tables of the money changers, or anywhere else, I would ask you not to be surprised at this, and not to interrupt me, for I am more than seventy years of age, and this is the first time that I have ever appeared in a court of law, and I am quite a stranger to the ways of the place, and therefore I would have you regard me as if I were really a stranger, whom you would excuse if we spoke in his native tongue, and, yet, and after the fashion of his country. I, that I think is not an unfair request. Never mind the manner, which may or may not be good, but think only of the justice of my cause, and give heed to that. Let the judge decide justly, and the speaker speak truly. And first, I have to reply to the older charges, and to my first accusers, and then I will go to the latter, uh, the later ones. For I have had many accusers, who accuse me of old, and their false charges have continued during many years, and I am more afraid of them than of An Anitus and his associates, who are dangerous too in their own way. But far more dangerous are these, who began when you were children, and took possession of your minds when their falsehoods, telling one of Socrates, a wise man who speculated about the heaven above, and searched into the earth beneath, and made the worse appear to the better cause. These are the accusers whom I dread, for they are the circulators of this rumor, and their hearers are too apt to fancy that spe spectacular uh, speculators of this sort do not believe in the gods. And they are many, and their charges against me are of ancient date, and they made them in days when you were impressible in childhood or perhaps in youth and the cause when heard went by default for there was none to answer and hardest of all their names i do not know and cannot tell unless in the chance of a comic poet but the main body of these slanderers who from envy and malice have wrought upon you and, and there are some of them who are convinced themselves and impart their convictions to others all these i say are most difficult to deal with for i cannot have them up here and examine them and therefore i must simply fight with the shadows in my own defense and examine when there is no one who answers. I will ask them, I will ask you then, to assume with me, as I was saying, that my opponents are of two kinds, one reason, the other ancient, and hope that you will see the, propi uh, pr uh, the prop propriety of my answering the latter first, for these accusations heard, not, heard long before the, other, uh, the others, and much oftener. Well then, I will make my defense, and I will endeavor in this short time, which is allowed, to do away with this evil opinion of me, which you have held for such a long time, and I hope I may succeed, if this be well for you and me, and that my words may find favor with you. But I know that, that to accomplish this is not easy. I quite see the nature of the task. Let the event be as God wills, in obedience to the, to the law I may defend. I will be, begin at the beginning, and ask what the accusation is which has given rise to the slander of me, of which has encouraged Meliticus to proceed against me. What do the slanderers say? They shall be per, uh, prosecutors, and I will sum up their words in an affidavit. Socrates is an evildoer, and a curious person, who searches into things under earth and in heaven, and he makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrines to others. This is the nature of the accusation, and this is what you have seen yourselves in the comedy of Aristophanes, which has introduced a man who we call Socrates, going about and saying that he can walk in the air, talking a deal of nonsense concerning matters of which I do not pretend to know either much or little, not that I mean to say anything disparaging of anyone who is a student of natural philosophy. I should be very sorry if Melicitus could lay that of my charge. But the simple truth is, O Athenians, that I have nothing to do with these studies, 
Very many of those here present are witness to the truth of this, and, and to them I appeal. Speak then, you who have heard me, and tell your neighbors whether any of you have ever known me, or hold forth in few words, or in many upon matters of this sort. You hear their answer, and from what they say of this, you will be able to judge of the truth of the rest. As a little foundation is there for the report that I am a teacher, and take money, there is no more true than the other, although if a man is to able to teach, I honor him for being paid. There is Gorgias of Olynthium, and Prudius of Sios, and Hippias of Illus, who go to the round of the cities, and are able to persuade the young men to leave their own citizens, by whom they might be taught nor nothing, and come to them, whom they not only pay, but are thankful if they may be allowed to pay them. <laughs> there is actually a Parian philosopher residing in Athens, of whom I have heard, and I came to hear of him in this way. I met a man who spent a world of money on the sophists, Callias, the son of Hippocrates, and knowing he had sons, I asked him, Callias, I said, if your two sons were foals or calves, there would be no difficulty in finding someone to put over them. We should hire a trainer of horses, or a farmer probably, who would improve and perfect them in their own proper virtue and excellence. But as they are human beings, whom are you thinking of placing over them? Is there anyone who understands human and political virtue? You must have thought about this, and as you have sons, is you thinking of placing over them? Is there anyone who understands human and political? Uh, excuse me. Is there anyone else? Is there is? He said. Who is he? Said I. And of what country? And what does he charge? Even as the pariah, he replied. He is the man, and his charge is five menu. Happy is Evanus. I said to myself, if he really ha has the wisdom and teaches us his modest charge, had I the same, should I have been very proud and conceited? But the truth is that I have no knowledge of the kind. I dare say, Athenians, that someone among you will reply, Why is this Socrates? And what is this origin of these accusations of you? For there must have been something strange which you have been doing. All this great fame and talk about you would never have arisen if you had not been like other men. Tell us then, why is this, as we should be sorry to judge hastily of you? N now I regard this as a fair challenge, and I will endeavor to explain to you the origin of the name Wise, and of this evil fame. Please to attend then, and although some of you may think I am joking, I declare that I will tell you the entire truth. Men of Athens, this reputation of mine has come of a certain sort of wisdom which I possess. If you ask me what kind of wisdom, I reply such wisdom is as attainable by man. For to what extent am I inclined to believe that I am wise, whereas the persons of whom I was speaking have a superhuman wisdom, which I may fail to describe, because I have it to myself, and he who says that I have speaks falsely, and taking away my character. And here, of men of Athens, I must beg you to interrupt me, e even if I seem to say something extravagant. For the word which I speak is not mine. I will refer to you a witness which is worthy of credit, and will tell you about my wisdom, whether I have any, and of what sort, and that witness shall be God of Delphi. You must have known Chirophon. He was an early friend of mine, and also a friend of yours, for he shared in the exile of the people, and returned with you. Well, Chirophon, as you know, was very impetuous in all his doings, and he went to Delphi, and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether, as I was saying, I must beg you not to interrupt. He asked the oracle to tell him whether there was anyone wiser than I was. And the Pythian prophetess answered there was no man wiser. Chirophon is dead himself, but his brother who is in court will confirm the truth of the story. Why do I mention this? Because I am going to explain to you why I have such an evil name. When I heard the answer, I said to myself, what can the god mean? And what is the interpretation of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. What can he mean when he says that I am the wisest of men? And yet he is a god and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. After long consideration, I at last thought of a method of trying the question. I reflected if I could only find a man wiser than myself, then I might go to the god with the refutation in my hand. I should say to him, here is a man who is wiser than I am. But you should set, you, you should said that I was the wisest. We, accordingly, I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom and observed to him his name I, I need not mention. He was a politician who I had selected for examination. And the result was as follows. When I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise, although he, he was thought wise by many, and wiser still by himself. I went and tried to explain to him that he thought himself wise, but he was not really wise. And the consequence was that he hated me, and his enmity was shared by several who were present and heard me. So I left him, saying to myself as I went away, Well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing and thinks, he, and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. In this latter particular, then, I seemed to have slightly the advantage of him. Then I went to another, who had still higher philosophical pretensions, and my conclusion was exactly the same. I made another enemy of him, and many others beside him. After this, I went to one man after another, 
being not unconscious of the enmity which I provoked, and I lamented and feared this, but necessity was laid upon me, the word of God, I thought, ought to be considered first. And I said to myself, Go I must to all who appeared to know, and find out the meaning of the oracle. I swear to you, Athenians, by the dog I swear, for I must tell you the truth. The result of my mission was, ju was just this. I found that the men most in, re in repute were all but the most foolish, and that some inferior men were really wiser and better. I will tell you the tale of, of my wanderings, and the Herculean labors, as I may call them, which I endured only to find at last the oracle irrefutable. And when I left the politicians, I went to the poets, tragic, death and rabbit, and all sorts, and there I said to myself, you will be detected. Now you will find out that you are most more ignorant than they are. Accordingly, I took them some of the most ela uh, elaborate passages in, in their own writings, and asked them what was the meaning of them, thinking that they would teach me something. Will you believe me? I am almost ashamed to speak of this. But still, I must say that there was hardly a person present who would not have talked better about their poetry than they did themselves. They showed me in an instant that not by wisdom do poets write poetry, but by a sort of genius and inspiration. They are like diviners, or soothsayers, who also say many fine things, but do not understand the meaning of them. And the poets appeared to me to be much in the same case, and I further observed that upon the strength of their poetry, they believed themselves to be the wisest of men, and other things in which they were not wise. So I departed, conceiving myself to be superior to them for the same reason that I was superior to the politicians. At last I went to the artisans, for I was conscious that I knew nothing at all, as I may say, and I was sure that they knew many fine things, and in this I was not mistaken, for they did know many things of which I was ignorant, and in this they certainly were wiser than I was. But I observed that even in the good artisans fell into the same error as the poets, because they were good workmen, though they thought that they also knew all sorts of high matters, and this defect in them overshadowed their wisdom. Therefore I asked myself on behalf of the oracle whether I would like to be as I was, neither having their knowledge nor their ignorance, or like in both. And I made answer to myself in the oracle that I was better off as I was. The investigation has led to my having many enemies of the worst and most dangerous kind, and has given occasion also to many colonies, and I am called wise, for my hearers always imagine that I myself possess the wisdom which I find wanting in others. But the truth is, O men of Athens, that God is only is wise. And in this oracle he means to say that the wisdom of men is little or nothing. He is not speaking of Socrates. He is only using my name as an illustration. As if he said, he, oh, men is the wisest who, like Socrates, knows this wisdom and truth is worth nothing. And so I go my way, obedient to God, and make inquisition into the wisdom of, of any, anyone, whether a citizen or stranger, who appears to be wise, if he is not wise. Then, in vindication of the oracle, I show him that he is not wise. And this occupation quite absorbs me. And I have no time to give either to any public matter of interest nor to any concern of my own, but I am utter poverty by reason of my devotion to the God. There is another thing, young men of the richer classes, who have not much to do, come about me of their own accord. They like to hear the pretenders examine, and, and they often imitate me, examine others themselves. There are plenty of persons, as they soon enough discover, who think they know something, but really know little or nothing. And then those who are examined by them, instead of being angry with themselves, are angry with me. This confused Socrates, they say, the villainous misleader of youth. And then if somebody asks them, why, what evil does he practice or teach? They do not know and cannot tell. But in order that they may not appear to be at a, at a loss, they repeat the ready-made charges which are used against all philosophers about teaching things up in the clouds and under the earth and having no gods and making the worse appear the better cause. For they do not like to confess that their pretense of knowledge has been detected, which is the truth. And as they are numerous and ambitious and energetic, and are all in battle array, and have persuasive tongues, they have filled your eyes, they have filled your ears with their loud and inveterate cal calumnies. And this is the reason why three accusers, Miletus, Aeneas, and Lycon, have set upon me Miletus, who has a quarrel with me on behalf of the poets, Annalus on behalf of the craftsmen, Lincoln on behalf of the uh, rhetoricans. As I have said in the beginning, I cannot expect to get rid of the mass of calumny in, all, in any moment. And of this, O men of Athens, is the truth of the whole truth. I have concealed nothing, I have dissembled no nothing, and yet I know what this plainness of speech makes them hate me. And what is their hatred but a proof that I am speaking the truth? This is the occasion and reason of, of their slander of me, as you will find out either in this or in an any future inquiry. I have said enough in my defense against the first class of my accusers. I turn to the second class, who were headed by Meliticus, the good and patriotic man, he as he called himself. And now I will try to defend myself against them. These new accusers must also have their affidavit read. What do they say? Something of this sort. The Socrates is a doer of evil, and corrupter of the youth, and does not believe in the gods of the state, and has other new divinities of his own. This is the sort of charge, and now let us examine the particular accounts. 
He says that I am a doer of evil.